This week on the Back Table Podcast. When I went into practice, I was not allowed to join. I went to the, the meeting of the SIR. I went to a workshop and I sat down and it was Barry Katzen talking about angioplasty. And, you know, I had done a fair amount of angioplasty by then. I did about 400 angioplasties my first year of practice. So I kind of knew how to do angioplasties. And he was talking and someone asked him a question about, well, how do you mix the nitro? And he didn't know how to do that. I raised my hand. He looks at me, goes, oh, are you a nurse? I'm like, hmm, I'm not going to answer and help you out just for that. <laughs> and that was sort of, yeah, the way it was. I was the only girl in the whole room. And I just never dreamed that I could be a leader. I never dreamed that I could be a fellow. I never, ever would have dreamed, wouldn't even thought about being president or gold medal. That was just way beyond, beyond. I just wanted to help. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. We will start the episode in a minute, but first, a brief learning moment from our sponsor, Inari Medical. This learning moment is from episode 196 on building a successful PERT team with Dr. Karin Gonzalez. What advice would you give to you know, IRs or other endovascular specialists out there in either private practice or academics that are, that are interested in forming a P response team in order to improve their management of P patients? So I would definitely recommend to those out there interested in creating a PERT program that you start small, limit the number of people initially involved in the planning process and select the most qualified, <laughs> compassionate and dedicated people to be part of your PERT team. It's not only important to make a treatment decision as a team, but it's also invaluable to have a support, the support of the team members, especially the pulmonary critical care docs, when you're doing the procedures, especially in those uh, critically ill patients. So if you have a strong team and a real dedicated team, they'll be with you in the middle of the night helping you manage the massive PE patients. So I think it's very important that the, the physicians are selected, you know, very, very um, carefully. You posted a, a pretty cool case on Twitter. It was big lollipop thrombus mm -hmm. that uh, that you got out. Yeah, so I think um, that was a big PE that we pulled it, out it and got like stuck it. at the toe, <laughs> the tip of the catheter. That wasn't that was a little exciting. Um, but I think there is a couple of things that we are incorporating in the per team that we haven't uh, seen before, and one is clot in transit. Uh -huh. And also uh, vegetations on either the tricuspid Ooh. valve or on a pacer leads, you know, so cardiac leads. So we have used the suction thrombectomy devices in those uh, circumstances. Um, and um, that has definitely been incorporated into our uh, PE response team. This learning moment was brought to you by Inari Medical. Now back to the episode. Welcome everybody to Back Table. Today I have the great honor to interview one of our IR greats, Dr. Kathy Kroll. I have known Kathy through SIR and just because she's Kathy forever. And now I'm really excited to be able to talk to her about her career. So joining us from Boulder, Colorado is Dr. Kroll. My first question, so I asked Dr. Kroll for her resume. It's about a thousand pages and it's fascinating. So Dr. Kroll, can you just start with telling us how you started NIR, what things were like in the early days, what kind of practice did you have? Let's start there. Okay, well, things were quite a bit different, actually. I went into radiology. I had intended to go into a clinical field, and at the last second, liked radiology. I, I was dating a guy, and he told me he wouldn't marry me unless I went into radiology, and I really didn't know radiology, really didn't want to be in radiology, but took a rotation and it sort of clicked. So I went into diagnostic radiology. And back in those days, it was still called special procedures. And there were starting to be fellowships. I actually didn't do a fellowship. I did quite a few rotations in special procedures my fourth year of residency, but did not do a fellowship. Really liked the procedural side of it, really liked the patient contact side of it, really loved the innovative side of it. So after residency, I went into private practice in South Bend, Indiana, 
And it was really a great group of people. They warmly welcomed me in, which I took to be the norm. Little did I know that that was really a special place to be. But they were people who'd been in practice mostly for quite a while. And none of them had real training in mammography, in uh, CT. There wasn't much depth in nuclear medicine and ultrasound. So I brought all of those things to the practice. MR was not yet a thing. I remember our graduation dinner of residency, they threw up this picture, a slide, and it was a lemon slice. You could tell it was a lemon slice and wanted to know if we knew what it was. And of course we didn't, but it was an MR image. And at that time, they still thought it was going to be spectrometry and physiology, not so much imaging for MR, but that image had taken like 63 days to image in the lab at Methodist Hospital where I was training. That was the first I'd heard of magnetic resonance. So I did not train in that, and that wasn't part of our practice when I went into practice. They were not doing much in the way of special procedures in South Bend. They had people that did a few angios, but not really any intervention, no drainages, no angioplasty. Grunzig had done the first angioplasty while I was still in training. I was, I think, a third-year resident. And I actually ended up doing a few angioplasties in my residency, in my training, but not a lot. That was still not a big thing. Kind of got a big splash when Johnny Carson had his leg done, had his SFA angioplastied, and he was talking about it on The Tonight Show. And so we started to see a few more referrals when I was in residency. But that was something I started in private practice when I went into practice. It was interesting there weren't any vascular surgeons in town, but the general surgeons were marvelous. They were great surgeons. And the level of medicine in South Bend, Indiana was really at a high level. There were some really well-trained doctors there. And the surgeons were busy. They were busy all the time. And once they got a little bit of confidence in me, they started sending me just all sorts of stuff. And I was very busy working all the time. <laughs> but it, it was fun. We were trying new things and doing new things. Didn't have a lot of equipment, but made do with what equipment that I did have. So some of the things that I can tell you that were really archaic that none of you'll remember, we had non-ionic contrast, which was exquisitely painful for patients. You'd heavily sedate them, but if doing a runoff, they'd really just levitate off the table, even though they were in a fairly deep, moderate sedation. We also didn't have digital subtraction and geography when I started my residency. That came probably my third year of residency. We got the first digital subtraction and geography in the state of Indiana and started to use that. Did not have that when I went into practice. In fact, we didn't even have a film changer when I first started. If you wanted to do a serial like cerebral angiogram or an abdominal aortogram, somebody usually a tech, sometimes the nurse had to stay in the room right next to the patient, right next to the beam. And after one exposure, pull out that film to let the next one get exposed and then pull that one out. And the timing of it was based on how fast they could pull it, I guess. So all the films went into the dark room and then you had to wait with the catheter and the patient while the films were being developed. I had a partner who smoked a cigarette all during the case, he'd leave it sitting on the counter smoking while he was doing a run, then come out, take his gloves off, smoke while the films went in the dark room. Things were a lot different. Patients could smoke in hospitals. You wouldn't even think about that now, but those are some of the things I can remember from when I first went into practice. This is so funny. I know they would cut me out if I laughed over this, but I mean, just sort of amazed at this and have so many questions. So I'm going to guess that the infection rate hasn't gone down now that we have that horrible red line. <laughs> I mean, what a dumb thing that is. You know, I bet you guys didn't do so poorly with infection rates and you could just hang out in whatever kind of clothes you want smoking. And people probably did just as well as this stupid line and the hats and the this and now we got to wear. Yeah, you know, we did not wear scrubs. I wore dresses. In fact, I started wearing good suits because I was always thought to be the nurse. and. I wanted to make sure people knew I was different. So I would wear these nice suits. I put my lead on and gloves and that was it. We didn't wear a mask. We didn't wear a hat. And yes, the infection rates were almost zero. I can't remember an infection. 
I think you could do us a favor. You could, I mean, the all the coding stuff you do is invaluable. If you could also make it a life goal to get rid of the red line. <laughs> <laughs> well, I changed after I started doing stints. When I started doing implantable things in patients, I really felt like we needed to step up. And I really pushed the lab to take full surgical technique, right? Did you marry the guy who wanted you to be a radiologist? I did. <laughs> I did. Oh, I have two beautiful, wonderful children. Okay. Are they radiologists? My son is a diagnostic radiologist and my daughter is a nurse. Wow. With an MBA in healthcare, yes. Does he realize how important you are? I mean, as an IR? Are you, I, mean, <laughs> I, feel like I think he has a clue because he had a lot of friends that went into IR and they were always asking him if his mom could help them. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. Well, yeah, good for you. So you married the guy with a radiologist. It got me to thinking, I, what I would say to somebody right now, like maybe if you're not in Bitcoin, don't bother or something. I don't, I don't know what my criteria would be, but it's interesting that someone would have <laughs> such, a, such a defined sense of that. But anyway, that's a side note compared to all the other stuff you've been talking about. Because you were really around with the advent of angiography, CT, MR, mammography, ultrasound, probably conscious sedation with, you know, sedation nurses. All of this has been developed since, I mean, you've been in practice. You were Correct. around the beginning of, a, of everything. Correct. When I first started doing angiography, everything was seven French catheters, very stiff, not very torqueable. We had very few choices of wires. You had a, a J wire or a straight wire. We had one that was uh, supposed to be, you'd be able to change the flexibility on the end by pulling the mandrel inside, which never worked. But I tried it a lot because we just didn't have torqueable wires. The glide wire came out several years after I went into practice and it just absolutely changed my practice to be able to get to places. And then of course, Catheter sizes came down, torqueability went up. My practice was almost all four French when I retired, and I could do everything I wanted with four French catheter. The balloons got much better year after year. The stents, there was this wild time of stenting when, you know, we'd been doing angioplasty and knew it worked pretty well, but it didn't work well enough. And so we tried a lot of other things. I did a lot of I had a laser in my lab. I did not use it much because it really fried the vessel. And even though it got the vessel open, the um, scarring after the procedure was so bad that the vessel got even worse. So people would come and, oh, yeah, I need a laser. I heard you got laser. I, okay, I've got a laser. But, you know, I don't think it's the right thing to use for you. And it got people in the door and got them so that I could treat them, but I didn't use the laser much. But then the stent came and the stent was something that really changed how we could treat vessels. It had its own problems, but it was much better and it changed the restenosis rate immediately. But then there was this wild flurry of everybody was putting stents in everywhere and stent companies were very competitive. So every month a new stent was coming out. I got really kind of involved with the off-label stent issues that came out of that. The stents all got approved after the first couple as biliary stents, and then that created all sorts of problems with coverage down the line. When was that? That was um, in the 90s. Because that same thing is happening now still. I mean, that's, as you're talking, you know, I've been around, not in IR, but like in life, enough to see the circular nature of things like tie-dye and mom jeans and acid wash. And in medicine, I've heard some of my mentors have said things like, oh, that's never going to work. We tried that 20 years ago. And you must have an incredible perspective on that because this, like the May Thurner stenting thing sounds exactly like what you were talking about back then. Right, exactly. So the initial stent trial was the Palma stent, and I was actually a co-investigator in that. And then the second stent trial was the wall stent, and I was a co-investigator in that trial as well. And those got on-label FDA approval. But after that, everything got 510K approval, basically, and all the different sizes and shapes. And FDA started to catch on, but they, they were 
approving these things right and left, there were more stents than there were blood vessels in the country. <laughs> and I would talk to them about that and say, you know, you've got to help us because as long as you are approving these and they're on our shelves, we are not going to get to on-label approval. Things were just changing so fast. You couldn't get a trial done before it was two or three generations behind. Yeah. I feel like that's what's happening right now. Yeah. I feel like that's, I mean, that's a hard, a big challenge for me where, you know, there's just too many of things. So it's interesting, like the glide wire, when you were around, when you had nothing, I feel we're really in a phase where it used to be one, now there's five, which means we're managing five different companies and five different people telling you everything they want to tell you about their 20,000 loans. And, you know, management of device is, I, I hesitate to use a new device because I don't want to deal with all of the noise around it sometimes, you know, with the contracts. It just is, gets to be too much. So, but it sounds like this has been going on for some time. I just feel like it's so complicated sure. now. And I kind of like the idea. I mean, the boiling water in the background is shaping the catheter. I mean, if you were to pick, if you were to design, you know, like maybe that's spoken like somebody who's spoiled and has access to too much. I mean, what would be your perfect balance of how many stents do we need and how many balloons do we need? Two companies, five companies? Well, yeah, I don't know what the perfect balance is, but you're right. There is a lot of competition in that space. And so everybody's trying to get your attention with this little twist on it and that little twist on it. And a lot of the little twists don't matter, but sometimes they do matter. And then you have to sort through what those are. I think that the hospitals have become much more sensitive to uh, letting reps in to the hospital. In an OBL, you have to set your own limits. I would set limits. I would see reps at seven o'clock in the morning for half an hour. And that was their time. I did a lot of negotiating with the reps for the hospital as well as for my OBL to try to get the best products in and to get the best prices. And the hospitals wanted to negotiate all that, but they didn't have the clinical sense and they didn't have the um, rapport with the company so that they couldn't always negotiate the best prices. So I think as a physician, I felt like having that control was important for me. And people would always, the reps would come in and, oh, you know, I've got the greatest new thing and you can build for it. And here's how you build for it. And they'd show me these surgical codes. And I say, you know, I don't think you want to be saying that to me. Oh, no, I'm the expert on this. I don't think you want to be saying that to me. <laughs> oh, what's funny. Did they know who they were talking to? <laughs> I know. I, I said, you know, I don't mean to be rude, but I don't think you want to be saying that to me. And they never quite got it. But I would say, you know, I... I think you can get yourself in trouble by telling me this. Oh, no. Yeah. So I think you have, I, there's so much to know as a practicing IR and nobody can know all of this stuff, but. I mean, it sounds like you do. I wish the companies would back off on trying to tell you how to code. I think that only gets them in trouble. Yeah. Well, I do take it as like a sign when, sometimes people come in and I don't, I don't feel like I'm being too egotistical saying this because I don't really think I've got a big ego or anything, but I kind of look at people and think, you know, I'm not like brand new at this, right? <laughs> For you on steroids, right? Because you're so kind and so kind of non-threatening and you don't lead with any sort of like your power woman suit and your superhero suit is like covered up by like a casual outfit, you know? And I feel like it would be Nobody should be talking to you unless they've done their research because they'll come in and talk to me like I've never done anything. And I'm like, um, yeah, I think I've got it. And so I kind of have paid, I pay attention to some of these things. Like if they spell my name wrong, I probably am not going to talk to them. Not because I don't want to hear what they <laughs> say, but I feel like their attention to detail is not going to be what I need. <laughs> so I have these like weird little things because otherwise you'll be, you know, drowning in things. But yeah, you, you are challenge because you actually know everything. I mean, you run all of the talk. Okay. So let's talk about this. Tell me about, you were the president of SIR, a gold medal winner. You were brought up in a time that SIR membership was not available to you in the beginning. I can only imagine what SIR looked like at the time. 
and you sort of wandered into this society. Well, you didn't wander. You, you probably had to do quite a bit to even be acknowledged in the society. And then you became the president and then you became the gold medal winner and you're still a retired and volunteer your efforts tirelessly for SIR. So tell me about the society and your relationship with it. You're right. I have been passionate about the society. It was a place where I could go and feel like I was at home, that people understood me. And I think most of us have felt that way over the, over the years. It's IR has been such a small community that you don't get that necessarily in your community as much, certainly not in a diagnostic radiology practice, but going to the meetings and being part of groups that are working it certainly gives you a sense of community. You're right. When I went into practice, I was not allowed to join. I went to the, the meeting of the SIR. It was in a hotel <laughs> in uh, San Francisco. And it was a very small group of people, maybe 100 people. But I just fell in love with that group and what I was learning and everything that I took home, I put into practice. And it was just exciting. My first meeting, this is a story I've told before, but um, hopefully won't embarrass people. But I went to a workshop and I sat down and it was Barry Katzen talking about angioplasty. And, you know, I had done a fair amount of angioplasty by then. I did about 400 angioplasties my first year of practice. It took about four or five months to get the first one, but then it just kind of went crazy. There was all this need. So I kind of knew how to do angioplasties and he was talking and someone asked him a question about, well, how do you mix the nitro? And he didn't know how to do that. So I raised my hand. I was really timid. <laughs> I raised my hand. He looks at me, he goes, oh, are you a nurse? I'm like, hmm, I'm not going to answer and help you out just for that. <laughs> and that was sort of, yeah, the way it was. I was the only girl in the whole room and that was what I thought. But I got to be a member and it was like the biggest honor to be able to join. And I, I have to tell you, I have never missed a business meeting at the annual meeting. I go every year. It just means that much to me. And I didn't think I could volunteer, but I decided to try. And they said, OK, your private practice. You must be interested in money. You're not probably good at anything else. And so I was not interested in money. I was not interested in economics. But it was my chance to be involved. And it became a passion for me because if we don't get the economics right, we don't have access for patients. And I have taken that on as a passion project for my, the rest of my career. Really didn't get involved with that until my kids were almost grown up. My daughter was headed off to college when I first volunteered. So I've been in practice for quite a few years before I got involved. But I was, I guess, you know, we are, we're all very passionate about what we do. And somehow I got mentored. I just never dreamed that I could be a leader. I never dreamed that I could be a fellow. I never, ever would have dreamed, wouldn't even thought about being president or gold medal. That was just way beyond, beyond. I just wanted to help. And so I just look back and think, I don't know how that happened, but I've just been fortunate. I think one thing that I tell people is people would come and complain all the time about, I don't get paid enough. I don't get paid enough. You need to fix this. You need to make it better. You need to help me here. And I would just look at them and say, you know, you need to get involved. It's all of us working together to make a change to this. And if you're sitting in your practice feeling like you're getting picked on and all this stuff is happening to you, you are a victim. But if you get involved, you can make a difference. And so I think that's what I did. I just felt like I wanted to make a difference. And we can all make a difference. By a little girl from a farm on Windfall, Indiana, who grew up in a class of 20 people, <laughs> can make a difference. Anybody can make a difference. Yeah, that's amazing that I feel that way, too, that I just sort of stumbled into things. I never thought I would be a fellow for sure. I mean, I was, I don't know if it's the private practice thing or you just sort of keep pushing forward and the curious mind and one thing leads to another. But I didn't go into any of this for the money back in medical school or now. And I always say that I'm like the worst paid interventional radiologist in the country, which is funny that we get this impression in private practice that we're all about the money. And I feel like it couldn't be a more 
opposite. Right. Because I agree with you. We're working day and night for our fields because we love it. And that's the business part of it. And we do all of this. But it's not the easiest way to make a lot of money. That's I don't think. Right. And I was never paid as well as most people. And I didn't care. I I was every day arrived at work feeling just blessed to be able to be there. When I was growing up, I was told you can't be a doctor. And here I was every day I was a doctor. It's like, I made it. I made it. You must have some, I mean, you don't have, I don't ever sense, like you said, like some bit some, and some ego that surrounds you. You just, you just sort of have this internal drive probably, or I also think if you're as smart as you are and your hands are as good as yours are and you want to be doing different things. I mean, I guess you did get involved with SIR after your kids left and that helps. I mean, that's that's a good lesson for me. I think that it's really challenging to do. My kids are still teenagers. And maybe one thing for everybody to learn today is that your career goes on as long as you kind of want it to go on and it doesn't all have to happen at the same time. Right. And I think another reason I got involved with the society, a lot of my diagnostic friends were saying they just felt like they were working on a production line. They were bored. They felt like they had golden handcuffs because they were making money, but they hated what they were doing. And I've always thought, you know, that's kind of on you. And so for interventional radiology, I never felt that with my practice. I, every patient was different. Every challenge was different. And there's a lot of cognitive work as well as the procedural work. And I loved being with the patients and I loved having a clinic and the longitudinal care. And that really kept me engaged. But being a volunteer in the society, it allowed me to use my medical training and learn new things from that and expand on that. And so I think even today, I'm doing new things and trying new things and different projects. So it's a way to keep your mind fresh and never becomes routine. I don't think it doesn't have to. I'll tell the audience the story of when I had a lot of issues with E&M billing, like everywhere I ever went until about two years ago. And billers always would tell me that I couldn't bill by time, which I like to bill by time, because then I don't have to worry about the complexity. Because I want I wish I was a physician in like 1932 where it was pencil and paper and maybe some penicillin. Actually, maybe not. I would say 82. I wish I was a physician back when you were, where you could just do things. And now it's, it's all this other stuff and it is what it is. So I had, Kathy was kind enough to be on a call with me and my biller, which is amazing that little old me could call the person who basically sits on the rack in the AFA and SIR and runs the whole world of IR coding. And um, we could have this call. And I remember that my biller started out sort of telling you how it was what she thought. And we took a pause and Kathy very kindly was like, so just let me tell you a little bit about my background and then rattled off all of your experience. And that shut down the conversation really quick, which was extremely helpful for me. So, you know, just the, for you to take, that's the kind of person you are to take the time to advocate for a one person practice is pretty amazing. I just feel like there's signs of that. Everything you do seems like that. Well, I am passionate about everybody's practice and I am passionate about patient access to the right care. And I will do that for anybody. As far as the coding, you know, I started in coding. That's what they started me volunteering as. (laughs) I have been involved in the development of every single IR code since the 90s. Wow. So I was the one that was sitting at the table arguing for them and negotiating with the CPT panel for a long time. And then I actually became a, a CPT panel member. So all the codes that came through, I had to review and help support and get them through and make sure that they worked. And then you're right, I did sit on the ruck as well as a panel member for four years. So I do have a lot of background in that. And when I hear people say, oh, you can use this code, it means this. And it, I spent, you know, 100 hours on that single code negotiating how it would be. And like, no, that's not quite right. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that is But I so am funny. passionate. I am just passionate about IR is being successful in their practice and having the joy that I got to have. Okay, so since I have you on the line, why do they have a port with a child less than five 
or older than five. <laughs> I don't, uh, oh, those codes went through when I was uh, working on this. And I don't think we pushed for that as IR, but because surgeons were doing a lot of the um, ports back then, in fact, surgeons at that point did most of the ports, they wanted those codes. So it went through as a package. And why, why is it different than an adult? Yeah, I mean, you think we're 18 or something, but there must have been something about the people who developed that, who in their hospital, some, you had to be like a qualified pediatric surgeon if they were less than five. Maybe it was something random like that. Oh, I think that it was just the CPT panel on the rock. So there's all these people, doctors mostly sitting on these, and there's negotiating because no one wants the other field to get ahead. And so you have to kind of negotiate. And we started out with a higher age, you're right, and it got whittled down to five. And that was the agreed upon compromise, hmm. knowing that putting them in peds is just more difficult and more risky. Well, five just seems like a funny pediatric <laughs> cut off. <laughs> I know they, they say that there's science to this, but sometimes it's just people trying to compromise. I also was doing some coding this morning and thinking about, again, since I have you on the line, I was thinking about, I was, I was typing in three, six, something, something, and wondering if there was any reasoning behind why some things start with four, some things start with one, some things start with three, three, four, seven versus. Yeah, there is some rhyme and reason to that. And the CPT manual is divided into body parts, basically. So the, the one section is, is skin and superficial things. Threes, the 30,000s are vascular. And they, the 50s are GU. The 40s, I think, include some uh, biliary stuff. The 70s are radiology. Oh, look, there is reason to it. We will get back to the episode in a minute. But first, a brief learning moment from our sponsor, Enari Medical. I did notice uh, in... Reviewing some stuff that you had you had contributed to a study in I think it was in the annals of, of uh, thoracic surgery on uh, surgical treatment of PE and so you know because of that I have to ask you you know in which circumstances are you guys going straight to surgery for this now pretty much never <laughs> that was my guess I was just curious yeah it, it really is never now I will tell you that the only time that we would push surgery or, or a surgical intervention would be patients who have a clot in transit and a patent okay. PFO with clot extending into the left atrium. That's when we are sending patients to the operating room. But pretty okay. much, no, we're not, they're not going to the operating room anymore. They're pretty much going to suction thrown back to me because we can get rapid results um, with that technique. And I, I think that there's been, you know, really across the board, a, a shift in the endovascular treatment of PE because of these catheters. And I, I think the data is still catching up and we're starting to see a bit more supporting it. But can you tell us about your experiences with this device and really how your approach to treating PE has changed since their introduction? So the large bore thrombectomy devices, and particularly the flow retriever device, which is a aspiration catheter, comes in three sizes, 16 French, 20 French and 22 French. And it just has a large bore side port and an aspiration syringe. It's really easy to use. It tracks incredibly well, despite being intimidated by the size initially. It really is easy. It's an easy tool to use. The suction thrombectomy device is very uh, reliable in the sense that it can aspirate acute thrombus, subacute thrombus, and even chronic thrombus. Um, huh. I'm surprised what we are able to extract in a few aspirations, and most importantly, just how dramatically better a patient gets um, on the angiography table with these devices. It's really a big paradigm shift in uh, the way we manage these PE patients. So I'm um, very glad that they have been developed and become more uh, simple to use. So I think patients are definitely getting better care with the advent of the PE response team at Jefferson. When you have a team of experts sitting there saying, yes, we all agree that this is the best thing for the patient, there's less reluctance. So the patient doesn't wait. This learning moment was brought to you by Inari Medical, 
Inari Medical is a medical device company focused on developing products to treat and transform the lives of patients suffering from venous diseases. Inari has developed two minimally invasive, novel, catheter-based mechanical thrombectomy devices that are designed to remove large clots from large vessels and eliminate the need for thrombolytic drugs. The company purpose-built its products for specific characteristics of the venous system and the treatment of the two distinct manifestations of venous thromboembolism, or VTE, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism. Find out more information at inarimedical.com. Now back to the episode. All right. Well, tell me about when you were president of SIR, I think that was 2006 to 2007, the year I finished presidency. Tell me, what were the challenges then? What was it like? I mean, I'm guessing also at some point we'll talk about the fact that you were one of maybe five women in this field at the time. You probably never saw each other. And this was before social media, obviously. So we have, I mean, now we have such a good network and ways to communicate. You really were all alone. Did you have, so I'm asking multiple questions, but one is I want to hear about your presidency. What were the big challenges then? Or what were the, what were the topics in 2006? And then the second thing I want to hear about is what was it like with your female colleagues? Did you talk to each other or you'd have to call each other on the phone? So I'll tackle the first one initially. And that was what were the challenges my year? So the biggest challenge was that that was right at the time where all the vascular work was being taken away by vascular surgery and interventional cardiology. And there was really this awesome panic and anxiety that IR was going to die. Most of our practices had been vascular up until that point. And we had seen this coming for a while, and we had been trying as leadership to get our members ready and trying to push them into clinical practice, but that was not being taken up. And that was really my biggest fear was that I was going to be president when we collapsed. So we did a lot of planning. That was when we came up with the idea to become our own primary specialty. It took another 10 years after that to get that through, but it started when I was president, um, I sat on that task force for a while and then other people who were much better really took it on and, and pushed that over the line. So that there were a lot of things that we did. The OBLs was a, another thing. We knew that professional payments were decreasing and were going to decrease. We did a lot of things to slow that and to minimize that, but the uh, handwriting was on the wall. And we've seen that over the last 20 to 25 years. but it was going to happen and we minimized the blow, but we needed another strategy of how to help our members stay in practice. And so the OBL was actually Gary Dorfman's brainchild. He said, you know, we need a way to take a share of the technical component, which is a much higher payment than the professional component ever was. And we started trying to figure out how we could do that. There wasn't methodology at that point for payment of the technical fees in an office setting. And we had to develop that methodology and we had to convince CMS and RUC that we could do this, that it would be safe and that it should be paid. And that took two or three years to get that through so that you can get paid. But that was all work that I was intimately involved with and passionate about. And then I did open one of the first OBLs after we got that through. Actually, my OBL opened before we got all of that through because I had enough knowledge of what I could do there and what I could get paid and I could figure out how to make it profitable enough that I could open it. Another thing that we were seeing, and this was something that I was the poster child for, I had joined a vascular surgery group. And so I was no longer in diagnostic radiology when I was president, which when I did that, it was not what I wanted to do, but the political climate at my hospital was so toxic and that was what ended up happening. And it ended up being good for a while at least, but I thought I'd be kicked out of the interventional radiology community and instead they saw that as a need. When I became president, it was the first year that they really said, okay, let's look at what we need strategically and pick someone who's a leader that will help us reach our strategic goal. So collaboration was a big theme of my presidency. How do we collaborate with these other specialties? 
in a way that allows us to continue practicing good medicine and doesn't close us down. So I, I, those were our big... You think you can get the SIR OEIS membership, combined membership push through? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll give it... A, we're we're on, the, on that ball, aren't we? We're trying. Yeah, <laughs> It's like a personal yeah. random weird mission of mine. I really think that the more we collaborate, the better we are. Yeah. And I think the SIR has struggled with meeting the needs of of smaller subgroups. And that's why we saw SIO break off and that's why OES broke off. But yeah, one of the reasons I've stayed involved is because I really am passionate that we are all the same community. And the SIR, we will all do better if we're under one big umbrella, but the SIR has to meet the needs of its members. It just has to do better at, at meeting those needs. So I would agree. Well, I feel like the members are for the SAR to lose. You know, we're all sort of these quirky, dedicated, very passionate. I mean, I know in our group, the private practice group, which as we're talking, you obviously should be in my position (laughs) Um, since you did all of this in private practice, which I still want to talk about. But I think we all lead with wanting to be a really, really involved in SIR because those are our people. And we only stop being involved when we were too frustrated to do anything else. And so I feel like there's been a shift, though, for SIR, but maybe that's just because I'm in the thick of it. But I feel like the current administration, if you will, is trying to address these needs. Do you? I, I agree. And I think they realize that this is really important to all of us. We have a much bigger voice politically, and there are going to be a lot of political fights that we need. ACR has to represent diagnostic radiology. That is the core of their membership. And they will sacrifice interventional radiology every single time to maintain a better stance for diagnostic radiology. That's just the nature of it. It's not that they're bad people. It's not that they're against IR. That's just who they have to be. But we as the Society of Interventional Radiology need to advocate for all of our members, and we will have a stronger voice if we do it together. I think the other question you asked me about women in IR, there really were not very many. It was less than, uh, it was what, less than 5% up until what? I think it was less than 3% when I got in. Right. And that was in 2007-ish. It was, right. now I think we're at 10. But then, I mean, I think Ann Roberts... Jim LeBur, you know, like who who else was there? I mean, I, I didn't have any experience working with women ever until I still never worked with another female IR. Actually, that's not true. For like four months, I did uh, my first job out and then she left. But I never had a female attending. I didn't really. I mean, I feel like we may be wired similarly where I just sort of plowed through things and didn't think about it a whole lot. Right. Yeah, you couldn't think about it because that would just get in the way of doing things. And and I put on blinders to all the things. I My first EC meeting, executive council meeting, I was sitting there and my, my MO is to sit and listen for a while until I get the lay of the land before I start opening my mouth. My dad always said, you can keep your mouth shut and people may think you're a fool, but when you open it, they know you're a fool. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. So... I sat there for three days and listened. And finally, the last day, I raised my hand to say something. And again, I don't want to, I, I won't say the name, but the uh, guy running the meeting, who is the incoming president, looks at me and he goes, you know, you just look like a soccer mom. And I I don't know what I can think about whatever you say. Like, <laughs> I mean, honestly, at least, I mean, that's the thing is maybe that era, at least you know where you stood. I mean, now, you know, do people have those thoughts and they just don't say them out loud. I do kind of feel sorry for the guys right now who have no idea probably what they can and can't do. But that, yeah, that stuff, I, I have been on the receiving end of some of those comments. Like, I have but no you just idea. Have to, you just have to ignore them. You just yeah. have to ignore them and go on. So I did. And, you know, Jan Durham was president two years before me. So we were in leadership together. I didn't know Anne as well because she had moved up and out of leadership and was more into the ACR. Plus, I was really intimidated. I could, I couldn't, hardly talk to her. Arena Van Breda, they, I was just intimidated. I was just not able to talk. And I, I couldn't talk to most of the guys either. I really didn't feel like I was worthy of being there. It wasn't until after I moved out of leadership that 
we started getting more women. And then they started having the meetings with women. And by that time, I felt like I was no longer, I, I had had my moment and I had had my opportunity. And I wanted the younger women to make it what they wanted to be. So I never felt like I was part of that. But I cheer them every single day. I listen to them and think, oh, they are so smart. Oh, they have figured out so much more than I ever did. And it's really awesome to listen to to your group and what you're doing. Yeah. Well, I feel like the ones who are the women who are getting out now are just the early career section folks are mind blowing. And I similarly am like, I need to take a step back and watch what this little crowd does because man, they are on fire and so ahead of the game. I mean, in med school, they're, they know people They're uh, It's, it's incredible, this early career section. And I feel like I'm like the middle crowd where we're sort of running our own businesses and we have our, we're like stable in our careers, but we don't have the, <laughs> but I still feel like an 80 year old woman. Oh, no, you, you are not, and, you know, you really have made a difference and you really brought women together and you've been a, a tremendous leader, Mary. Please don't ever say that. But I, I think just watching, I, I know I never had a mentor. No one ever said you need to do this to further your career or these are the things you could do in your career. And these are the ways you could get to that. And now I hear people, women saying, I want to do this and I'm going to do this, this and this so that I can get there. Like, wow, I just never had that. That's where I find the most satisfaction is like people who are kind of early out in jobs who are navigating. I mean, I didn't have anybody and I feel like, I mean, I was on the fetal position, you know, not knowing what to do <laughs> at times. And and then it's true, you go to SIR and you run in, I remember running into somebody, if a woman there, and in one second, you know, just kind of like, it's going to be okay. And this is what you should do. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I just got this advice. And you know, you don't want to spill your problems to perfect strangers in your professional society. But I think now I think you have that was a genuine interest. And it takes so little. I find a lot of satisfaction in sort of helping people navigate the early job. You know, I don't know the middle, I don't know the middle of the like the 60 to 100 percent, you know, percent of the career, but the early time, I feel like I went through a lot. And I think sometimes it doesn't take very much to just tell people a couple, a couple helpful things. And a lot of it's just easing pressure, you know, because you come out of fellowship full blown and you just you want to accomplish so much and just to say, like, it's going to be OK. And just, you know, one to, one and two years at a time. And I mean, your evidence of how long an amazing a career can be, it doesn't all have to be stuffed into the first four years, even though it feels like it at the time. Yeah. I really commend you, Mary. You you have gone through a lot and you've learned a lot and the willingness to share that. I think that's one of the beauties of SIR, though, is that we all think we have these problems that we're failing at and we're unique. And yet most of the problems, most of the issues are universal. And when we can talk about them with each other, we often either feel at least supported, but often also find different solutions that we may not have been able to come up on our own. So I think keep doing that. Please keep doing that. Well, that's the purpose of that business meeting. I thought, well, if I had to figure some of this out on my own, I might as well just put it all on a desk for yep. people to watch later. So, you know, the entrepreneurial competitive spirit that other people have would say you're giving away all your secrets, but why wouldn't I just make it easier? If we can all just make things easier for the next guy or gal, it just seems like we can all just be less stressed and things can be easier and we could work less and spend more time with our families and know things faster. <laughs> so I worry a little bit about we are bringing more women into the field which is wonderful. But I keep hearing we have this one strategy. We're going to introduce women in medical school and, and in early trainings and convince them to go into radiology, into interventional radiology, which is getting people into the field. But I worry that we're not trying to look at the back end. When the women come out, all of our trainees come out now. They're bright. They're well-educated. They're eager to go. And yet we are, they're meeting a wall when they come out often of trying to find a right job. Private practice is still 
in general, not welcoming of women or minorities. A lot of private practices don't want you to do clinical medicine, and that's what we're training people to do. And I truly believe that our future is clinical, that if we continue to be proceduralists, we will not have a rosy future. But I think if we become clinicians like we're training these people to be, they can do anything they want. They could be the king of their practice. It is true that like right now, I feel like if somebody, if I were going into a job, I would be very clear about what I was there to do and what I commanded <laughs> to be at the job. It, it would have to be only one way. And that would be the way that I wanted it. But I feel like the younger crowd, yeah, there you have this idea of this clinical practice and it is not what most jobs are. And I think that is the angst and the conflict that people have. Right. We need to change that, right? Or else we're going to implode. We'll, we'll no longer be able to attract people if, if we're not able to find them the jobs they want. And you're right. A lot of people come out of training and they say, this is what I want. They get promised they're going to have a clinic and then they don't. And then they're sucked up into diagnostic work. And that's just a dilemma that the next generation is going to have to sort out. There's a lot of reasons to do diagnostic radiology, and a lot of people like doing that. But if it keeps you from building your IR practice, and that's what IR becomes in that hospital, then other specialties will take over the interventional services. That's exactly what happened to me. I came out and was promised clinic and everything else. And two years, I tried to make it happen. And I did it on my free time when I had two babies and a husband who traveled. And I was like, I mean, and I wish somebody would have looked at me and said, this is madness and you don't have to do this. And I, there was nobody. And I just worked harder. Every time I just tried to work harder. <laughs> and it doesn't change a radiology group. Like you, you can't work your way into them deciding a clinic. And so it was just the weirdest thing. I thought it, I felt crazy because I asked all the right questions. And you're not alone. Well, I felt very alone. And for sure then, because I didn't even know who to talk to about it because I just thought, well, they told me I had clinic, I should be able to do this. But I didn't know how to negotiate that or push back or walk into their door and say, this isn't working for me. I never, ever, ever, ever would have done that. So it kind of gives me a little PTSD thinking about people still going through that. I have some questions for you. Some get to know Kathy Kroll questions. You have been a delightful hostess in your beautiful home in Boulder, Colorado, for a group of women IRs to get together. And that was really one of the most fun things I've ever done. So here are some personal questions. How do you spend your free time? I have developed a lot of interest since I've retired. Unfortunately, I say I'm retired, but I'm still working quite a bit. So it's cutting into my free time. But I have enjoyed hiking a lot. I bike some, picked up pickleball. I'm taking piano lessons again. I love to entertain and have guests and cook. Just a good excuse for a great group of people around a table having a in-depth conversation about whatever is interesting that day. I saw that you're part of the Boulder Newcomers group right? Which I just yes. makes me so you'll be so good at that. You're such a such a polite, kind, welcoming hostess. And, you know, you also have a Wikipedia page, which not very many people have, which for the <laughs> audience, that's pretty badass. I Wikipedia searched a bunch of people when I found out that you had a page. And I'm here to tell you very few IRs have a Wikipedia page. So rock concert or country music festival? Oh, well, classical. <laughs> I'd probably do classical. Mountains or the beach? Both. Can I have both at once? Wow, you want it all. Wine, beer, or martini? Well, not beer, but wine, my martini, you're talking my, talking my talk. All right. Well, who would you have dinner with? You could have dinner with anybody in the entire universe, living or dead. Oh, gosh. You know, my favorite people are my kids, and I just relish and treasure the time I have with them. That's a good one. Beyond them, I, I don't know who that would be. Okay. Kids is a good answer. I force my kids to go out to dinner with me so we get solid one-on-one -on -one time. And it is one of my favorite things to do because they have to sit and talk to me. Mine are still teenagers, so they're 
not really wanting to, but I make it happen. It's time well invested, Mary. I did that with my kids too. What's your favorite gift to receive? I'm not very good at receiving gifts. I like giving gifts more than I like receiving them, but I would say probably flowers. Ooh, my next question. What's your favorite flower? Oh, sunflowers. Oh, that actually really goes with your personality. That's sweet. What is, we're going to move into the more procedural. What is your favorite interventional radiology trick? Hmm. And you can pass if you don't want to. Yeah, I, I don't know what my favorite trick was. I think my practice my last few years was almost exclusively vascular. So I did just tons of vascular stuff. I did a lot of carotid stenting. I did a lot of aortic endografts, a lot of limb salvage, a lot of port placements, dialysis work. And I I really loved, I felt like I had this talent after seeing so many cases where I could look at a case, look at a film, and I could say, this is going to work. I'm going to be able to fix this. Or, you know, this isn't going to work no matter what I do. And one of my partners asked me about that. And I think it had just come over a lot of time, just being able to say, nope, I'm not going to be able to help that. But if I really try, I can get this one open. Yeah. What's your favorite code? My favorite code? <laughs> Do you have one where you're like, I fought so hard for that thing? Like you, something you oh. want to put on a t-shirt or yeah, your, yeah, that, your license plate? Well, all of them. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Mechanical thrombectomy took us like a year of going back to meetings and we, so at the CPT meeting, you used to sit up there and they grill you and everybody talk. And then once they were all done asking their questions, the music would start and that meant the panel was going to vote. And oh my gosh, I had gone through all this with mechanical thrombectomy and the music playing. I'm done. I win. And somebody stands up and it was the guy from CMS. And he was kind of a, not a very nice guy. I will refrain from saying what I wanted to say, I guess. but. He stood up and goes, oh, I have one more question. He hadn't even prepared. He hadn't even come to the meeting prepared. So he's looking through the stuff as everybody else is talking. And now I'm done. And we've wasted our money. I've traveled there. We spent our days there. And we didn't get it. And this, this happened several times with mechanical thrombectomy. Carotid stenting was similar. We, it's a game of strategy, which is why I think I liked it so well. Is you had to kind of anticipate what they were going to ask and have a, an answer ready. And it had to be kind of clever. <laughs> You're the IRRBG. She strategized her whole career. Yeah, you had to think 10 years ahead because if you did this, then it's going to affect all these other things and it would be a domino effect. So you really had to be like chess playing at the table. I, I really kind of like that game. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen then for coding for like PCS and GAE and PAE? I mean, in terms of, well, I guess just coding and then approval. And why can't we get pelvic congestion covered well? So I'm, I have good news on that. We can't get that covered because we don't have good data. And we have some data, so it allows some coverage, but we don't have great data. It's just such a complex syndrome that has a lot of causes, and we've not been able to sort out all those causes, let alone who's going to benefit from intervention, right? But Neil Kanlani did a research consensus panel a few years ago, and he has kept working on that. And the foundation is funding his trial. And then Ron Winokur has a, a second trial coming right on the tails of that. And they will dovetail with each other to uh, actually get data and publish that data. And the foundation is strongly supporting both of those trials. So good news on that front. And that is why I'm still involved today is I worry that we see payment and coverage policy moving more toward evidence-based and we don't have evidence. All the time I worked in economics, we were fighting that, but that fight needs to be fought harder, which is why I pivoted to the foundation and research. We have to get data. We have to have that. We have to publish. If we don't, we won't have coverage for even some of the things we take for granted and we know help patients. That's why I think the um, registry that's being proposed has got to happen. One of the things I think members look at that and say, well, you want me to do this for you, for the society, right? One more thing that I have to do for the society. And that message is not correct. The message is the society is putting in a 
huge amount of time and money to do this for you, for your practice, because this is what is going to allow you to continue to practice and for you to have an easy way to get that data into a bank and get it published with minimal work and minimal cost on your part in your practice is going to be a big investment in your future. I would agree with that. I think that the registry is the answer to all this. It's weird when you're inside something, though. You, It's hard to know what, what it looks like from the outside, even though I was outside of SIR, you know, three and a half years ago. Everything that the society does. I mean, I honestly thought the foundation was the gala. And I don't know, maybe it's sponsored somebody's doing something. I had no idea what the foundation actually did because it sounds so um, like gala and charitable and not so serious. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but actually the foundation's critical because it funds the research that allows for the things like the codes. And, and for, I mean, you can probably explain this better, but I've learned that the foundation prioritizes certain research projects. And so if, you know, you have SIR, you have IR members, IRs who are interested in PAE, that can be a focus for the society through the foundation that will fund the research, which is incredible. And I think that I think that we're, we all need to be on Vertex for no other reason than just to ease of capturing this data. And I can't believe how inexpensive it is. I thought, you know, most of these registries are so expensive. And I'm saying this as someone who actually hasn't executed it yet in my practice, just because I have other things happening, but it's on my like short list of things to do. But I do think that that's the answer especially as we start to branch out into all these, you know, smaller practices. And we all need to be able to capture this data. The other thing that I think members have looked to the society and been unhappy with what they're getting is the value of IR. And they want the society to give them data that proves their value locally. And that's just a hard thing to do. But that is another thing that the registry is going to allow each person, each practice to do to demonstrate with hard data what your value is. And your value may be a lot of different things depending on what's important in your practice and which audience you're needing to talk to. We have, we all have a lot of audiences we have to convince, first being our diagnostic partners, our hospital, our patients, our payers, our referring doctors. And the value message that you give each one of those audiences is different, but you should be able to pull out hard data from your practice to give your own local value. Plus, having really deep national data will allow us to really drive that value message. I just can't believe that you're still this involved in things. I mean, you're you're like deeply, deeply involved in all of this. And I feel tired just listening to you and you're on like the billionth year of doing it. And I just wonder, <laughs> did you ever, have you ever just tapped out for a year and been like, I'm going to go hike in Boulder and listen to some classical music and I'll think about the AMA later? Yes, I did take a little time off after I was president. I was pretty fried after that and then came back in. And, and it is definitely time for me to step back again. We have young, energetic people with great ideas. And I'm happy to be some historical and maybe some perspective of resource for that. But it's definitely time for me to go hike more. <laughs> yeah. I feel that my brain is like completely full and I'm going to need I'm going to need to take a little break coming up. And because it is a marathon, you know, I think that we I think a lot now about all the decisions that are required in our jobs, you know, decision making, especially doing cases all day where, you know, in the OBL setting, as you know, you know, you don't have backup. So everything is, everything's intense and especially vascular, bad vascular disease and then running the business. I mean, it's so many decisions and I have this idea of brain fatigue has been really fascinating to me. So I think about keeping up at this speed for another 20 years and I'd I can't make that happen, but it sounds like you did take. You don't want to make that happen. I think that is very solid advice that you're giving yourself. Burnout is a real thing. For so long, we've been told, oh, you just need to take better care of yourself. Well, how can you take better care of yourself when you're working 20 hours a day? Right. You can't. And when, when the hospital's making you jump through all these different hoops to do this and that, 
and they take away some of your decision making. The burnout is real. And I think I suggested that as a research topic this year. It didn't get taken up. I don't think other people were thinking about that. But I think as a specialty, we have our unique causes of burnout that are different from other me- parts of medicine. We have a lot of the same, but I think as a specialty, we need to be looking at that. And I want you to look at that for yourself, Mary. I look at you and I think, oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, people always tell you, you should take a break. <laughs> You're like, but yeah. how? Right. And- and so this is really, the, I mean, it's a good problem to have. I guess you're busy. But we, we also, I think that people, especially, I mean, women and really anybody who goes in IR, we are a unique force to be reckoned with where we don't, we're not a weak breed of people. And so if, if it like hurts a little, we'll take another, you know, blood makes the grass grow and put up or shut up and all these kinds of things that work and can get you pretty far in your career. But at some point, you get older and things like running marathons just can't happen anymore. So I do think that burnout and the reason I think it's important is because I don't want I mean, I recognize when I am burnt out because I stop caring when I show up to work. I'm like, oh, God, I've got oh, this better case. I like yeah. dread like oh. Oh, I'm going to get through this. And I don't want to be in that position because I no. I want to be able to, the reason I have my own OBL is so that I can feel great every day and show up and like really want to be there and be excited. And when everything just starts to seem like a chore, it's definitely time for me to take a break. It is definitely time. And we need to be thoughtful and mindful to not even get to that position. And I think that's one of the things I hear in the Women in IR group is them talking some about self-care. I also hear them talking about how they have to do so much more than the men to get ahead and to get noticed. And I think we've got to find a better balance than that because none of us, even though women are tough and we're smart and we're hardworking, it's not fair to ourselves, our families, and even to our patients or partners to work ourselves to the bone. We were all trained to just smile and always say thank you no matter what's handed to us and we were all trained that you know when the guy says you didn't do that well enough when he means you did it too well and you're showing me up we take that oh yeah I just need to work harder I need to work harder and that's not the right message that's not healthy and we've got to find a way to retrain ourselves to think that it is good enough and that we are doing well enough yeah, I mean, I the need to prove yourself over and over is for real. It's funny. I've learned to the whole smile and nod. I realized with some of this business stuff, the guys will take it, you know, the business guys, the suits, I call them, as yep. a submission or agreement. And they'll throw out something and I'll just kind of sit there and smile and nod. And inside, I'm thinking, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I would never sign up for that. <laughs> But, and I'm kind of like tuned out and I'm just kind of smiling, naughty. And I'm like, well, it's great to see you. Yeah. Thanks for coming by. Da, da, da. And then that to them, they've sealed the deal, which I find so funny. I mean, this has happened to me a lot. And I realize yep. it's because I'm not saying to them, you're full of it. And that's not how it's going to be because I don't even, I don't like conflict and I don't want even to have the conflict with them. And as long as I'm not signing a piece of paper, I'm not agreeing to anything. And it's an interesting thing that I've experienced, I would say in the last couple of years, being the decision maker in this OBL, that my silence is mistaken for agreement. Right. And you've learned to manage that. We all have our own ways of, of learning to manage that. Yep. One of my friends recently told me, she said something I found profound, which is kind of hilarious when I think about it, but she says, no is a complete sentence. Yeah. Well, I, I think the problem with no, that I've had. I say I know a lot. This year has been the year of no for me, but I do feel so. I, I said no to a lot of talks at SIR, and you feel like the opportunity is not going to come around again. Which I've had to push through that a lot, and then just say like, okay, so so if nobody ever invites me to be on a vascular panel ever again, that's okay. And I love doing it, but I love doing all of it. And I think that there is a fear, especially kind of early on now, not so much. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to make or break my career to have to not be speaking at something. But I think for sure early on, the fear of saying no to things, even when you're overwhelmed. And that's where maybe a great role for a mentor that helps you pick and choose, you know, what's important. Right. And I think 
I agree. And no, it's, it's hard to say no. But for women, we never just say no, because it's always, well, why not? Why not this? And you always have to explain yourself. A guy can just say no, right? You can oh, ask God, him a question. Yeah. He says no, and you're fine. But for women, it's like, well, why not? And then you have to go into this roundabout explanation, and they still don't get it. Like, we should just be able to say no and move on. <laughs> So I have, I will never forget a business meeting I had at a restaurant where it was so, it was like my mind had to stay ahead of the game and I was so exhausted. And it was one of the first business meetings I came because they were, I was trying to be convinced to do something. And I was very clear, like in order to do what you want me to do, I need one, two, three, four, and five. It was written out. It was very simple one-liners. And the answer was, no to one, no, no, no. And they're like, let's talk about item number one. No. Let's talk about item number two. No. Item number three. No. And so it went like that. And then in the end, they're like, so we're all good? <laughs> and I was like, no, because I just <laughs> said. And then so the dinner revolved around how they were trying to like out explain and outrun sort of why I didn't actually need, want, or understand my asks that were not even that big. It was like accountability. You know, I wasn't saying necessarily, I want to make this amount of money. I mean, these were these things that were, you know, and man, to this day, I feel exhausted even thinking about that dinner. And I think about that a lot about <laughs> the game of negotiation and, and not being good at that. And I need a hitman, a handler and a hitman, I would call it, you know, somebody who I know that I cave under, I don't cave to agreement, but I don't push back hard enough, but I know it on the inside. So I know to hire like around that somebody who can who can say no for me? Kathy, I don't know that I'm ever going to learn at this age. <laughs> you are learning every day, Mary, and you are awesome. You are awesome. Well, did you? Yeah, well, I'm sure you had, you have a, okay, let's end on, I love medicine in like the 70s, 80s, 90s, just before what I feel like is like all the chaos of medicine, which is, you know, the administrative part of it. Do you have a most favorite patient, memory, case, something that stands out. I know it's hard. I mean, you have a billion years of amazing IR work from, I mean, the angiography, the film story is just, I mean, I'd probably think about that for the next four days of someone literally pulling the film, <laughs> trying to be really fast at it is kind of a crack up. I wish we had videos of that. Do you have a favorite case, person, thing, anything that we could end on? Here's one. I, here's my one of my favorites. So Early on in my career, I had a young woman, early 30s, come in and she was having kind of vague stroke-like symptoms. She had been in a car wreck, had a whiplash, gone to the chiropractor, who was a dear friend of hers. And when she came out of the chiropractor, was walking to her car and felt very dizzy and went home and didn't feel well, felt worse the next day, came into the hospital. And, and she ended up on my angio table for a cerebral angiogram. This was before CT angio was done. And I did the carotids and they looked pretty normal. And then I thought, I'll look at the vert. And she had a uh, dissection of a vert with a thrombus in the basilar artery. And so nobody had done thrombolysis in the head yet. And so we were debating and we decided that's what we would do. And Don Schwarten was my senior partner and he was famous. I was still this young girl who didn't know, but it was my case. And so I'm doing it. And she became real agitated. So we had to sedate her. So we didn't have any ongoing neuro checks. And I was just scared to death. So I put this big sheath in her groin and sent her upstairs overnight on anticoagulation and couldn't sleep all night. I went in the next morning, just reading what I was going to find, went to the ICU. And as I'm walking down the hall, I can hear her yelling. I mean, she, and I get in there and she's on her phone, on the phone. She was a stockbroker, I think, and, and yelling at her people, do this, do that, do this, do that. <laughs> and she was, I know, I'm like, oh my gosh. And so she came out of it normal. And that was probably one of the first cerebral thrombolysis cases. And the follow-up to that was about 20 years later, I walked in the room to meet a patient and she goes, you don't remember me. And I'm looking at her and I look at her name and it was her mom. And she wow. looked at me and she said, you saved my daughter and I got all these pictures to show you. Oh. And that, that was, you know, that's just 
an example of what we're able to do as interventional radiologists. Yeah, it makes it all worth it. Those are the moments. That's why we do all of this. Yep. That's a great story. Well, it was so, my, it was such a pleasure. Um, your name came up as somebody to interview and I jumped on it because I've always really enjoyed, you're like this wizard of eyes that I get to see at SIR meetings occasionally. And I just am so amazed by you and everything you've done. And I feel like you should write a book. <laughs> well, I hope what you take out of this is that I'm just like everybody else. And, oh, gosh. you know, I've had amazing opportunities and I took advantage of some of them. And we are all special and we all have so much to offer. Yeah. But thank you for letting me tell some of my story. Well, thank you very much. And we'll see you soon at SIR annual meeting. All right. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. And newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.